Twitter has served as a positive tool for pro-democracy activists who are suffering under authoritarian regimes. It has provided the equivalent of a public forum in places where productive national conversations around the issue of human rights do not exist. But hosting the world's conversations is a tremendous responsibility. Welcome to Dissidents and Dictators, a series of conversations by the Human Rights Foundation dedicated to exposing and challenging authoritarianism around the world. In this episode, Twitter and Square CEO Jack Dorsey discusses with HRF President Thor Halverson the role that Twitter plays in shaping global discourse, the challenges the platform faces for being so public, the future of blockchain and Twitter, and much more. Hi, Jack. Welcome to the Oslo Freedom Forum. Thanks for having me. So I guess I'll, I'll just jump right in. Um, it would have been great if we had had this conversation in Norway proper, uh, but uh, we'll, do, we'll do the best we can. So, and we'll, we'll do it again as well. Oh, excellent. Excellent. So in this way you can meet some of the very activists that, because of Twitter, have a voice. T Twitter is such a positive tool for pro-democracy activists that are um, under authoritarian regimes, to, uh, regimes where freedom of expression does not exist, regimes where there is no equivalent of a public square, where censorship and repression allow a stifling of all kinds of political speech. And Twitter has changed all this. Twitter has essentially permitted people who otherwise would not have had a voice to open up a national conversation in, in places where, uh, you know, sometimes they do it in their own name, sometimes it's pseudonymous, sometimes it's an anonymous. Um, it is truly an awesome responsibility that Twitter has allowed this to occur, that, that, that this exists. Now, we are very critical of Twitter sometimes. People, you know, they pile on Twitter, but we don't really know what's going on behind the scenes. And, and again, I stress the awesome responsibility of carrying the world's conversation is something that is definitely worthy of admiration. Now, what do we not know? What, what, what's it like on the inside? Well, I, I think um, one of the most beautiful things about Twitter is that uh, um, we have created it with the people that are using it every step along the way from the very beginning. You know, we started with a very simple idea, um, which is something we wanted to see and we wanted to use in the world. But as we gave it out to more and more people, um, they made it their own. And that started with the at symbol. It is something that we did not invent, something um, like the hashtag, another thing we did not invent. Um, the retweet, the ability to spread it to your followers, we did not invent the, the tweet storm and the thread all came from the people using it as well. So inside the company where I think our strength is, is we, we are able to observe very well. We're able to be, um, we're able to take uh, critical feedback. We're able to see some of the patterns that emerge and then make them accessible to more and more people. So inside the company you have a bunch of very um, empathetic people uh, you have people who are really good observers who want frank, critical feedback because we know we're not building this for us anymore. We're, we know we're building it for um, all these people that we serve. And um, I think the you know the after some of the tech early adopters, the the first major constituencies to join the platform were journalists and activists. And every major constituency that joins in mass, adds a new dimension to the service that we weren't expecting. Um, we weren't expecting activists to use it. We weren't planning for it. Um, and they had very different needs than we were originally imagining. Um, pseudonymity became very important. Um, the ability to follow accounts um, became very important. The ability to DM uh, and create communities around hashtags and watch what was trending in a particular country um, became very important. So these are things that, you know, we we put out um, and then we watched, we observed, and, and we made better. And that is you know, true to today. Um, I think, you know, the, the biggest thing that we're wrestling with is all the new challenges that technology provides, um, such as misleading information and how um, people might be gaming the system 
in order to artificially amplify information or uh, to make the conversation overall less healthy and less valuable uh, in the end. So if, we're... If, if I can jump in there, uh, the pseudonymity, you, you mentioned pseudonymity, and of course pseudonymity is essential for some of these activists who can't use their own names when telling truths about certain things in certain countries. Yet, even though pseudonymity has played a, a crucial role in protecting the activists in these uh, oppressive regimes, it has also enabled authoritarian governments to manipulate the uh, minds of millions of people by creating fake accounts, by spreading disinformation um, in the case of, say, Russia, uh, in the case of Saudi Arabia. Uh, the, the positive influence of Twitter is, is countered by these vast armies of, of trolls who serve the governments and they, they bring in positive information down, negative information up, false information, you know, people with like zero followers who spend all day tweeting, this, this sort of thing. And they attack independent voices. Um, many times they end up drowning out the voices of independent users. And uh, a perception is created, I mean, in the case of Saudi for certain, in the case of Russia, that, that the ruler of the nation is popular, is loved, is supported. And so suddenly the hashtags in favor of MBS or in favor of Putin are way up there um, and they're trending topics. Um, yet the truth is totally different. H how can and, and how will Twitter uh, reduce the reach of these unverified accounts and, and, and stop these bad actors from uh, abusing your platform. I mean, they, how do you create a balance um, between an online public square um, filled with independent voices and one filled with trolls and with fake accounts? I appreciate the difference between anonymity and pseudonymity. Anonymity feels a lot more random. Um, pseudonymity is built identity. And that is what we want to value and that is what we want to protect ultimately. And we have seen attacks against that and they have been more anonymous uh, attempts where people are creating accounts or states are creating accounts uh, in mass. Um, and whether they be bot driven or a organization of humans that have an agenda, um, the, they take on similar patterns, which is trying to game our system specifically around trends um, in order to artificially amplify information or a trend that just doesn't naturally exist, doesn't organically exist. And in the early days, we just were not prepared to recognize this or handle it. Whereas today we are. Um, we've taken a lot more action on uh, recognized patterns, just looking not at the accounts themselves, but looking at the network between the accounts. Um, looking at where these accounts might come from, look at how new the accounts are and how quickly they get up to speed in terms of one particular agenda, one particular hashtag, uh, one particular message, and then acting much faster on it. And I think it's really important and we believe it's critical that in order, in, in the course of uh, work of, you know, identifying these networks, um, of amplif artificial amplification and then actioning them, taking them down. We have to be transparent. Um, we have to be open with what we found, what we did, uh, and what we're looking for in the future. And e each one of these comes with a risk as we disclose it, because as you disclose some of these risks, you're also showing some of the holes in your system and, and showing how others might be able to take advantage of it in the future. Um, but we've gotten much better at staying steps ahead of some of these attacks. So that's one is just looking at the network. Another is, is looking at the incentives of the product, looking at the product sur surfaces themselves and are they still serving the original intent? Trending topics, for instance, has, um, is, has been an area that people have focused on both in terms of seeing what's happening in the world and seeing what's happening within their community and their, their country but also as a vector for attack and a vector to uh, influence and, and shift minds. And there's certainly a lot we can do to recognize what's happening within that network, but there's a lot more we can do to make the product a lot better, to add more context, to show more of the connections, to enable people to drill down further so they can see what's really happening. Um, and then of course, labeling of both accounts um, and tweets 
uh, as we have credible information to determine whether this account might be state-owned or state-associated, um, whether these accounts might be new, um, whether they might be controlled by an API endpoint or a bot versus someone on their phone who's opening their phone with a biometric. These are all signals that we can use to make the credibility of accounts and therefore the credibility of their information at least much stronger, but more transparent ultimately so that people can make decisions for themselves when they see these trends, when they see these particular accounts and, and know that this message carries with it um, a, a different degree of consideration that, that people have to be aware of. So um, focusing on the network, focusing on the, the, the product surface area, making that better, and then adding context and credibility where we can determine it. Um, is, is how we're going after this. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, excellent that Twitter is taking this here seriously because for some of these governments, you know, control of the flow of information, control of propaganda, um, the use of disinformation and misinformation is an absolute existential um, s subject for them. With, if they lose control of that, they could lose control of their country and they're, you know, literally lose control of the government. If, if we take the Saudi example, they, we've ta they've taken it so seriously that they embedded, they put spies inside the Twitter machine. They, they had engineers hired by Twitter who they had essentially propped up and placed there. And in 2015, Saudi agents were to have discovered to have infiltrated Twitter. And their goal was to get into the back end and identify the, to, to be able to identify specific people who were tweeting against the crown prince. When, when this was exposed, the, the message sent, I mean, literally, people on Twitter, uh, users felt naked. They, they literally, it was so chilling that human rights activists and dissenters, especially from the Middle East, could be um, I identified this way and exposed and it ultimately arrested and, and, and God knows in some cases disappeared. What, what measures uh, has Twitter taken to ensure that this sort of thing d doesn't happen again? I think it's, um, so, so from a system standpoint, uh, everything I mentioned around strengthening our system, applying more machine learning, you know, years ago we had to do this in a very mechanical way and that can be slow and it can be super lossy uh, in terms of us just not seeing everything. But now we are applying machine learning uh, in a much more uh, fulsome way. Um, we're able to see a lot more. Um, we're able to share with our peers what we're seeing and what they're seeing, which gives us more confidence that this is uh, in action uh, by a particular group that is um, not authentic and not genuine. Um, Whereas in the, in the past, we probably weren't doing enough of that. And it's often the case that this is not an attack against any one system. It's an attack against many systems uh, to make sure that people are seeing it across different products and, and services. Um, I think it's really critical that we maintain a uh, connection and collaboration uh, with journalists, with civil society, with activists, and getting... Uh, constant feedback and pointers too, um, because we we're looking at one particular thing, which is how the system is working and the patterns that emerge on top of it. Um, but if we don't hear the other side, if we don't hear the questions, if we don't hear the dangers, if we don't hear um, the critique, we're going to miss some of the things that would be uh, that would be important to address and to figure out and to acknowledge. Um, so it, it it's really really uh, in incredibly important that we maintain these open channels to make sure that we're seeing everything that we need to see and when we're not that people are holding us accountable to it and calling us out for it right but in this case it was a social engineering hack they literally the saudis put people inside twitter i mean my, i mean how do you how do you stop that how do, how, do, how are you going to i mean what, what what do you do to stop the chinese government from doing the same thing uh, or or you know any any government who hires a uh, you know a firm that engages in, in uh, you know, a, a, a private spying agency, such as you know, Black Cube or the people who created Pegasus out of Israel. How, how, do, you, how do you ensure that, that essentially the keys uh, to that back end remain in the pockets of those who are going to protect the identity of these human rights activists? Yeah, well, I, 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 I fundamentally believe that security is not something that can ever be perfected. It's a constant race. 
Um, it's a constant push to be 10 steps ahead of your attackers. And I, I think there are, are a few elements that are really important within that race. One is creating a lot of agility internally so that we can recognize uh, you know, flaws quickly and then fix them uh, and advance them. Two um, is getting outside feedback and people who are watching from different angles and researching from different angles to actually see what's, what's happening. And then third, uh, making sure that we're building the right secure systems within our platform so that um, we ha can have trust in an untrusted environment. Um, and there's a lot of newer technologies that provide for this. I mean, the, the, whole, of, the, the whole spirit of Bitcoin, for instance, is to provide a trusted system in a distrusted environment, which is the internet. And those technologies will provide us new capabilities where we can do this internally as well and provide a lot more peace of mind in terms of us at the company, but also the people that are using our service, um, that this is something that um, even if you have untrusted parties entering in the system as workers, um, as people who are using the service, that it is still secure, it's still protected. And the more of those technologies we build in, the more of the technologies that are linked to um, an identity and a security system that you as an individual uniquely own, the more we can use biometrics to hook that up, whether it be face ID or touch ID or, or something that we're not uh, considering right now, um, the more we're giving the individual the keys, the safer this whole system is going to be. And right now we're just not in that state, but we are working towards it. And when I say we, it's the whole industry of the internet. And you see this most fundamentally in the work in Bitcoin and blockchain. And, and that's what gives me a lot of hope uh, and a lot of peace of mind to, to, to help these issues and to help thwart these issues is because the keys and the control will actually be more and more in the hands of the individual rather than a corporation or rather than a government. I, the, the idea, I mean, uh, shifting the conversation to building the future is, is, is definitely something I, I want to end with. But if, if I can go and, and discuss briefly, because again, it, it's, it's very important to um, so many people in our community uh, to put this question to you. Look, Iran and China are countries where Twitter is banned outright. Nobody in these countries can tweet. But officials from these countries, like from China or Iran's foreign ministry, they use Twitter to express the government's point of view. So essentially, the, the, the government minister can tell the world what, what the position is of the government or misinform, uh, whether it's about COVID or about anything else. Yet, the people of that country can't use it. So why are you letting them uh, use it and yet they ban their own people. Isn't it hypocritical to allow officials to have verified Twitter accounts to promote the propaganda of, you know, the Iranian and Chinese regime while they ban their own people from access to your platform? Well, there are people in China and in Iran that are using Twitter, that are seeing what people are saying, um, including their leaders on Twitter. Um, and they're doing so through um, safe VPNs. Um, they have friends outside of those countries and uh, collaborators and um, colleagues outside of those countries who are also watching. And I do think it's important to show the dissonance of what's happening on the ground versus what the leaders are saying to help hold them to account and to also see um, what they're doing. I, I do believe it's important at least to have their voices um, in the open so that you know um, how the story of the country, how the story of the regime or the administration um, is being told to the rest of the world. And that, that information gives a much more credible fight. It gives more information with which to utilize uh, and to, uh, to strengthen um, the activism around. So I, you know, it, it, it does, on the surface, it does feel dissonant that we would enable that. But I do think it's important to see as many of the voices as possible, especially the ones that you, you disagree with, um, uh, so that you can understand how they're thinking and what they're trying to say and how they're trying to represent um, the whole of the people um, to the world when, in fact, that is not 
um, how it should be represented. That is not uh, the particular case. And, and that context um, that we also provide, uh, I think, is important for the rest of the world. We just started labeling uh, state-controlled media or state-associated media, um, and it gives a context to the rest of the world that this is associated with the government um, who activists might be against. And having that context um, and giving that information to people um, you know, gives them a different judgment on what they're reading and what the intent is and if there's an agenda behind it. Well, you, you, you started labeling the officials from China, Russia, but then you also added France, uh, United Kingdom, and, and the U.S. What, I mean, I've, you've been going into what has propelled this decision to have wider information. Are you going to adopt this worldwide? Are, are all, when, when officials from different countries, are, are, are you going to have that as uh, announced so that people know that? And if we can take one step further, there are state propaganda vehicles, like for instance, RT, which is very popular in the United States, and very few people realize that it is actually Putin's network. It literally is Putin's network. It puts out information that Putin wants out there. And many times it's misinformation or false information. By the same token, you have TRT out of Turkey, and you have um, uh, other state-owned vehicles from dictatorships that are pushing uh, a, a particular agenda. And a lot of people, uh, it, it looks like the BBC, it looks like CNN, it looks like something that otherwise you might think is credible, but it, in the end it actually is not. RT is not credible, and yet people are, are disseminating it like it's, like it's a credible privately owned network subject to the same kind of standards of journalistic ethics as we have um, in the West. Are you going to start labeling those as well? We are. Uh, we, wanted to, we wanted to start small. We wanted to um, uh, start with uh, more known entities that we could learn from, um, test out the system, and then as we understand it and we understand both the positives and also the negatives that we're improving, we can roll it out to more and more. Um, and I think it's you know, important that, that we do that, that smaller test because we'll get feedback um, from activists on, on what's working and, and what's not working. And, and that's just critical to our work. If, you know, in the, in the past, we, we may have moved very quickly to cover the world uh, with that. And, and that would have been in error because it, it, it may have created more confusion because the product and the understanding of it just was not as robust as it, as it needed to be. So I think it's really important as we do, as we take steps like this, that we take small steps and we allow them to grow and we uh, take in all the learnings and, and just try to understand as much as we can before we expand it even further. And that's one of our greatest lessons over the, over the past five years um, uh, is, is, to, is to slow down a bit, pace it, and make sure that we are doing the right thing, uh, integrating the, the critical feedback. And I believe we were one of the first um, to... Uh, to, to ban RT from utilizing our advertising systems in order to propagate their, their messaging. Um, and we are also one of the first, uh, if, if not the first, to ban, to ban all political advertising on our platform as well with the principle of um, political speech should be, should be earned and not paid for. Um, so, you know, all of these represent ideas that we think are credible after talking with people. Uh, and then as we, as we get more understanding about them, um, to, to roll them out and to scale them and to make them much more impactful and, and much more accessible by more people. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's all sounds like a lot of very good things that are happening. I, I want to note for some of the people that may not know this, that Twitter was, um, was one of the major global tech platforms that announced that they would be pausing. When, when the Chinese regime had the Hong Kong national security law imposed, essentially making Hong Kong a jurisdiction of the Chinese Communist Party's um, uh, legal system, they uh, y you paused all data requests from the Hong Kong police. And this was, from, from those of us from a human rights perspective, it was such a, 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 an important step of you basically counting yourself as um, not um, being a part of the um, legal system of the CCP. W why, do you, why was this an, an important thing for, for Twitter? Um, it, was, it, was important. it was important for us because it's, it's true to who we are. 
Um, you know, we've had a long-standing relationship um, and usage with the, the people in Hong Kong. Um, and we've also had a, uh, a lot of experience and a track record of pushing back uh, on governments um, that are um, egregiously going after a particular journalist uh, or activist uh, and fighting for them. Um, and we have a history of doing this, um, not just around the world, but also within our own country in terms of um, making sure that we can take these actions, making sure that we, are, uh, we can have transparency around any requests that governments around the world uh, ask of us, um, and that we, really, uh, that we really fight hard for the, for the people that are, that are on our service. Um, and you know this was you know this one made sense immediately, and something that we worked with um, uh, uh, our civil societies uh, around the world to to help understand and to to strengthen our moves. Um, and we want to make sure that in any of these actions, that uh, people have awareness of of why we're taking it, and um, and some of the uh, some of the upside and the downside of those actions for the for the company for the service and also for the people who might be using it. Well, it was uh, definitely something that um, what was noticed by everyone in the human rights field. I, I, I want to go back to what you had started discussing when it comes to blockchain and building the future. In, in this past December, uh, Twitter announced that you were going to be uh, funding a, a small team of five open source architects and engineers and designers to start developing an an open and decentralized standard for social media. So the goal was ultimately to be a, a client of this standard. Um, can, you, can you explain that to people who are not techies, who are not like blockchain enthusiasts? Um, uh, what are the risks of an internet that is not open and what does it mean to having a decentralized standard for social media? There's probably a number of you who remember um, the older internet, um, Usenet, IRC, Internet Relay Chat. Um, and what was interesting, and that's the internet I grew up on. And what was interesting is how decentralized the internet was at that time. And then what was difficult, well, difficult about that decentralization was actually discovery, finding content, finding people. Um, that would be like-minded. And that is what Google represents. It's centralizing the discovery problem. It's what Facebook represents, centralizing a discovery problem. It's what Twitter represents as well, centralizing the discovery problem. And now we're in a world that blockchain exists, um, that Bitcoin exists, that decentralized technologies exist so that now we can build the discovery problem on a much more decentralized foundation. And what I think that does um, is generally a lot of our value in the past was around content hosting. So we would host the tweets, we'd host the images, we'd host the, the videos. Blockchain and Bitcoin point to a future and point to a world where content exists forever where it's permanent, where it doesn't go away, where it exists forever on every single node that's connected to it. Um, and what that means is the job of content hosting goes away. The job of discovery uh, is the most important thing. And we've, you know, we've had to really consider what that means for us as a company. What that means is we're not in the content hosting business anymore. We're in um, the discovery business. And we're going to have a particular approach on discovery, which is healthy conversation. Um, healthy public conversation that, you know, you know seeks um, to uh, help people understand what's happening in the world, to have conversations about what's happening and hopefully solve problems together. And what that means ultimately is we need to become a client of something much bigger than us. We need to enable people to contribute to a public blockchain, and we need to be able to enable people to be able to pull and see from that public blockchain as well. And if we're able to do that, 
it's something that's really powerful and something that I think speaks back to the power and the original intent of what the internet could be, um, which is uh, something that anyone in the world can access, and anyone in the world can um, make decisions around in terms of their engagement, in terms of what they own, in terms of what they see, in terms of what they share. And uh, companies like us can build a business on top of that um, that uh, contributes to that greater whole, but, but pulls from it in a way that's compelling to people. And um, we wanted to advance this. So we're going to hire five uh, engineers and, and some folks to start building Twitter as a protocol. And one of the things we heard early on in Twitter's history is that this is so basic and so simple, it kind of feels like a protocol right now. It doesn't feel like a company. It feels more like a movement and it for, feels more like a technology that I can use to build whatever I want to build on top of. And that was such a magic time and such a magic understanding of what Twitter was. Um, and we want to get back to that and we want to help the world get back to that as well. So. Right now, we're in the in the in the um, in the phase of finding a leader for it, but this is a completely separate nonprofit from the company. Um, this group will be uh, tasked with building a protocol that we can use, but everyone else can use, and then we'll really focus on becoming um, a client of it, so that we can build a compelling uh, service and business on top of a much larger corpus of conversation that anyone can access and anyone can contribute to. That's quite inspiring. Now, uh, before I ask you one last question, I, I have to interrupt and ask. So you, in the background, I either hear a dragon or a <laughs> the king of the roosters, or I hear a, the, a massive parrot. What, 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 what's going on? I mean, it sounds like you're um, in a dragon's lair. I'm, <laughs> I'm in a more rural area and there's a, there's a very proud rooster. Okay. It's Next a rooster. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Okay. So we got the technology and agriculture. That, that, that's, that's, that's quite nice. Aviculture, I should say. So um, Jamal Hashogji, who had attended uh, the, the Freedom Forum in Norway months before uh, he was murdered because he posed an existential threat to the control that Saudi Arabia's government and the Crown Prince had over Twitter over the Twitter conversation in that country. People are, are, are gonna you know, learn in, in Brian Fogel's film that he was essentially killed because of, of, of Twitter. Um, currently, Omar Abdulaziz, a Twitter activist um, who was uh, very strong in, in, in creating a counter to the disinformation campaign of the Saudi, his brothers are currently in prison there uh, precisely because he was able to defeat the Crown Prince's trending topics. Um, my, my, my last question is more of a request. Would you accept an invitation from the Human Rights Foundation uh, to join the campaign for justice for Jamal Khashoggi? Yes, absolutely yes. Um, Jamal represented the best of what the service is, you know, the intersection between journalism, between activism, between speaking truth to power, to holding power to account. Uh, into influencing change and creating a public conversation around what needs the atrocities and what needs to change about um, organizations and regimes around the world. Um, so, you know, this is really critical to us. It's really important to the world uh, and something we will definitely stand for. Jack Dorsey, thank you very much. We hope to see you in Norway the next time. Thank you so much. I look forward to meeting you all in person. So long.